uh, a, our webinar uh, about the GitLab AI features, which helps us to boost uh, the productivity in dev ops cycle. So, uh, I will briefly uh, review the agenda. So we'll talk about the AI features in DevSecOps cycle, uh, GitLab's view on this AI features. Then we will talk about uh, all of them and I will briefly show you a demo. And in the end, we will have a Q&A session. So uh, you could write your questions in the chat and in the end uh, on the session, we'll review them and answer all your questions. So, um, all right. Uh, my name is Ilya. Uh, I'm uh, a CloudFresh professional service engineer. And here is the Peter. He is uh, a architect in GitLab, a solution architect. And we are the company who provides uh, the services and uh, the vendors' products uh, around the whole of the world. We're a, a GitLab select partner and professional services partner as well. And also uh, a Zendesk, Asana, and uh, Google Cloud partner. So we provide entire cycle of uh, services. Uh, it's a development, integration, training, uh, and support, audit uh, also. So if you choose the CloudFresh with GitLab and you want to implement or develop some features, implement uh, GitLab in your company, you won't be alone in this process. So CloudFresh helps you with engineers, support specialists, and all that stuff you need to provide service in your company. All right, uh, this is the list of services. And briefly, you could check our packages that we provide for customers and the businesses which trust CloudFresh. Uh, as I said before, this is the companies uh, all around the world, but we also focus uh, on the East Europe. So it's, it's Ukraine mostly, but we also work in Europe, uh, in North America, like uh, around the world. All right. And Peter, please, uh, could you tell us about the AI, AI power uh, in DevSecOps platform of GitLab? Yeah. And tell us a bit more about the features that GitLab provides in this way. So you're welcome, Peter. Stage is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ilya, very much. Um, just a microphone check. Can you actually hear me properly? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Cool. It's just, yeah, just that my devices are giving me the the headache, the biggest headache this morning. Obviously, when else? When you need to present, that's when the technology shouldn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Good morning, everybody. I hope you have a smoother morning than I have with my microphone and my headset. My name is Peter Bojo, as Ilya very nicely introduced me. I'm a channel solutions architect at GitLab. So my job is to work together with our excellent partners like CloudFresh to help our customers, GitLab's customers, to use our product better. So I work very closely with partners like CloudFresh. And that's why I'm here in this presentation. I would like to talk a little bit about what GitLab is doing in the AI space, how we are competing with other products and what are, what, what are our uh, main differentiators compared to other solutions on the, on the DevOps market right now. So let's start with the title. It's it's titled AI Powered DevSecOps Platform. I think it's a very overloaded term, but I think it's still better than calling it Dev AI SecOps or something like that. So I, I believe the, the naming became like this to not to overload even more the poor DevOps acronym here. So that's what I will talk about, how we how we do that, how we put the AI into the DevSecOps. And uh, before I talk about the actual topic of this in this presentation, just a disclaimer here that whatever you are seeing in this demo that Ilya will do and whatever you hear from me and see on the slides, what I'm presenting here 
is true only today, so on the 29th of August of 2023, right? So our AI product is evolving incredibly fast. So what I'm telling you right now might be not true next week or might be different next week. So just please take that context into account when you when you refer to when you refer to later what you learned today here. So our documentation is always up to date. So you can always refer to that. I'm just saying that what you will see here is absolutely subject to change. That's all the text here is about. So that out of the way, let me start with the actual topic. So what we what we what we mean when we talk about AI at GitHub, what is our approach, how is it different? And Honestly, I think our approach is not very surprising if you know GitLab already. So GitLab, GitLab's main differentiator up until this point, so up until the big boom of AI, I would say this March or this April with the with the popularization of ChatGPT and similar solutions, up until that point, our strategy was more or less the exact same as it is right now. We just put AI on top of it. So our unique approach to the whole DevOps uh, space was always that we are one platform. So GitLab is a single application. As you can see on the slides, the third point, I'm starting with that. So GitLab is a single application. We have a single code base. All of our features are part of a single product. If you are familiar with GitLab, if you, are, if you already used it, you know that the UI is the same. If you hosted GitLab yourself, you know that installing GitLab is literally installing one application, not multiple applications. And this fact, this core part of the architecture of how our product is built is affecting obviously how we relate to AI as well. So instead of putting AI in single features of the platform, our approach is to put AI, AI capabilities of, into the existing features of the platform. And through that, as you can see on the right side of the slide, this circle, we are able to improve productivity, not just for developers, but more or less every, or we, we try to cater for every persona in a software organization. So from project managers to security professionals to platform engineers, we are putting AI capabilities in multiple parts of our product. And through that, we are making not just the single act of writing source code more productive or faster, but the overall life cycle of a software delivery project is becoming more effective through this approach. And last but not least, the third point on the slides that we are a privacy first and enterprise grade company or product, whatever you are uh, looking at right now. What we mean by that is that it's very, very important for us to be 100% transparent about what we do with customer data. So when you are using our AI products, if you refer to our doc or AI features, sorry, we have a single product with AI features. So whenever you are using our new features, which contain AI capabilities, if you go to our documentation and if you go to the settings of your GitLab instance where you configure these settings, it's 100% clear what part of your data is being processed by whom and how. So you can, as a user of GitLab, can be very conscious about what you share with us or with third parties. And you can decide, okay, this is not compliant with my processes, I won't use this feature. Or you can say, yeah, this is fine, I will go ahead and use this feature, but there's never the question of what's happening with your data. It's always very clear and very transparent to you what's going on. And that basically connects into the enterprise greatness, so to say. So our biggest market is in the enterprise segment. So this privacy first approach is mainly because we see that this segment is very, very conscious about what's happening with their data. Most of our customers are self-hosting GitLab just because of that reason. It's not because they don't trust us and they don't use GitLab.com because of that. It's because simply they are mandated by different regulations, different rules or laws in the countries that they operate in. So we want to make sure that they can keep working as they today, using GitLab as they are using today, but take advantage of our AI capabilities at the same time. So they don't have to decide between, okay, do I want to use the cool AI stuff? Or do I want to be compliant with the laws of my country? There's no no decision between the two options. You can do both. At least that's what we are aiming for. That's how we approach AI and GitLab. 
Yes, and uh, why we ended up in this uh, ended up with this strategy? I mean. Obviously, the enterprise first and the privacy first, I think, is obvious from what I just said. I just want to connect back to what I said a little bit earlier, that our approach is not that we zoom on in on just the code writing part of the of the DevOps lifecycle or DevSecOps lifecycle. But what we realized when we sit down and started to build out our air strategy that actually even developers or even people whose job is to develop the code. So I'm not talking about project managers, not talking about security engineers, just the actual developers who are writing the code. Even they don't spend all of their time with writing code. And if you look at the other personas, obviously, it's just even more. I mean, they spend even less time with writing code and with other stuff that still contributes to the success and the progress of the software de delivery project. So we took a look at that, and that's when we realized that okay, we don't we we must not cater only to the software engineers or the software developer persona. We must go beyond that, and we must put AI into the hands of all the personas in in a software delivery project. And for the rest of the presentation, that's what we will be looking at. So obviously, we will have a demo about code suggestions because that's one of our main features still, and that's one of the new features that we have, so to say, so a new capability built into GitLab, but we will cover all the rest of the AI empowered features, which are, as I mentioned previously, more about putting AI into existing features. So you already had the other features in GitLab, we are just making them better or more productive or more accessible to all personas in a project by putting AI capabilities into them. And one more slide regarding this. I really love this slide. And if you are an already, already a GitLab user, or you are already using some kind of DevOps platform, not necessarily GitLab, I think this diagram is very telling about our approach towards AI. So it's basically that what you see on the diagram right now, we call it the GitLab flow. And the GitLab flow is about how you get from an idea, so a backlog item, into production. And as you can see on this slide, we basically marked each and every step of the life cycle with the AI features that we build in, right? So you can see very clearly, in my opinion, how, how we just put new capabilities in each step instead of introducing new steps, right? So, so even code suggestions, which is a new thing, as I mentioned, even that connects back to just the just the creation of new new code, not necessarily a new step in the DevOps lifecycle. So yeah, without further ado, let's talk about the actual features. So hopefully, what you came for. Let's talk, take a look at the actual features. And before wading into that, and before handing over the the microphone and the stage back to Ilya, who will do a nice demo of our code suggestion feature. I want to just give you a high level overview of our features. So what are they and how they, on the on the day-to-day -day basis, how they contribute to the productivity of your team members if they are using GitLab. So we have two main categories of AI features. One of them we call AI assisted features. That's what we will look at first. And that's like honestly 70% of our AI features. And these features are useful to all of our customers. Doesn't matter if you are developing a mobile application, a web application, um, IoT device, doesn't matter what you use GitLab for. The features, the majority of our features that we will cover first is hopefully applicable to your team. So there's no specifics about these AI features. They are just improving the existing parts of GitLab. And the other group of AI features, which I will talk about at the end of the presentation, we call model ops. More about that later, what does that mean? But these group of features are, are targeted at the specific group of audience who are developing their own AI models, right? So, so the big portion is about you just use AI, like a chatbot, like an intelligent agent during your work. And the other group at the end of the presentation is really about 
how you as a software developer team can develop your own AI models, your own chatbot, your own big data processing pipeline that utilizes AI. So that group of features is really about people who need to develop their own in-house AI. And uh, yeah, pretty much that will be the structure. And before handing it over for the demo, I just want to give you a high level overview. So this slide lists all of our AI features. And I think it's very useful to understand and very good for conveying the message that I was trying to convey by words previously, like this is how we cater for all, persona, all personas in a software delivery project, right? So as you can see, we identify three group of people, so to say, the developer teams, the security and security and operations teams, and so to say for everyone. So regardless if you are security, regardless if you are developer, regardless if you are a project or product manager, the third group of features we hope will be useful for all of your all of your employees or all of your team members. And disclaimer here, as you can see on this slide, we have three categories of of products or features that are in terms of availability. So we have experimental, beta, and general availability. General availability, let me start with that as the easiest. Those are the features that you have in GitLab right now. So those are the production ready features that we are support you. If you have a problem with them, you get the same level of support as always. Then we have the beta features, which are I would say one step away from becoming production ready, but they are still not production ready and they are still, they still under ongoing development. So code suggestions and explain this vulnerability are those. And then we have the experimental features, which are, as the name says, they are truly experimental. So some of them are really early in the development cycle. The next stage would be beta, but they are before that. So these features might change significantly. And in terms of what I mean by significantly, even the UI of them might change completely until they go into uh, production. For beta, it's not like that. Beta features most likely will stay like that. They might change something, but overall they are stable. Experimental are, are completely under development. They are very volatile. So please, when you review these features yourself, then, then take this into account that, that this is the state right now. And as you can see, the developer teams have the, the most uh, features right now, but this is something that we are, again, as I said at the disclaimer at the beginning of the presentation, we are completely, completely, uh, completely, sorry, continuously iterating on these features, adding new features. So the other two columns will extend in the near future. We just cannot share those features yet, but rest assured that we are working on evening out the playing field. We just started at the developer part because most of us at GitLab are developers. So obviously we can build the features that we need or we use as well. And as you can see, you can, by, by, by now you most likely have read the slides themselves. So I don't want to spend your time with going over each of the features here. You can see here very clearly what each feature is doing sometimes just by their names, but below them you can see the value they can bring so for example my favorite one is the person this is my personal favorite one by the way so the the explain this code in the middle column bottom of the middle column explain this code is really about you can select any kind of code that you have in your git repositories in gitlab and then ai uh, feature will explain to you in plain english what's going on there we will talk about that later but I just wanted to give you an idea how how this uh, diagram looks like and or what what does it mean actually. So yeah, let's for the rest of the presentation we will with Ilya we will together we will just walk through all of the features actually. So you will get a feel for each of them. And uh, without further ado, I want to actually hand back the microphone to Ilya, who will do a very nice demo for you about code suggestions. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That uh, was amazing describing of the GitLab vision uh, of the AI features. And what about the code suggestions? So uh, it allows developers to reduce the time spent for the basic uh, functions, the basic coding, and focus more on the innovations and 
develop their creativity uh, like uh, it helps developers to improve the productivity yeah and make them more focused so uh, the code suggestions in gitlab uh, supports most uh, of the high level programming languages and also the inst infrastructure instruments like uh, google cloud cli uh, the Kubernetes resource model and their form, et cetera. It also let you be more freely in uh, the way uh, you choose the coding uh, environment. So it could be just the code editors as uh, VS Code or just the text, text editors with some additional plugins like uh, NeoVim, or it could be like uh, full JetBrains ID or Microsoft ID. So uh, it um, provides people the service uh, which they could freely use uh, in all of the uh, environments. Uh, they always program it, yeah? So you don't need the special program uh, from GitLab to, to use their features. You could use it right now in your environment. So uh, this feature available in like ultimate and premium GitLab, you could also use this not only on your computer locally, you could also use this feature in the GitLab web ID. So uh, let's uh, get into my ID. Just give me a second. one moment all right here is my vs code i hope you all guys see this uh yep peter it's okay all good all good all right great so uh, i have an example it's just the little calculator and javascript i will also show you some more features but it's just a simple example how could how could you reduce your time with these features so we have an add and subtract uh switch cases so and we also have a unit test for this uh, and i have an adding test and subtraction test so first of all as a maybe a programming uh, uh in the programming at all you want to start from the test uh, like not from the coding and then testing uh test first so and i want i could start like from the typing uh, something and the gitlab uh, provides me the suggestions but i also could just type uh, create a uh, like multiply test please yeah and it it advised me the test uh, like the whole code of the test and we could just a little bit complete this yeah like this yeah uh, and uh that's all that's all we didn't spend uh, so many time to, to just uh, type the basic functionality and if we save this and i'm running the npm test it fails because we didn't uh, complete the calculator uh, switch case but if we go back to the calculator we already have the test and we could type just case uh, and it will just suggest the multiply but we could also uh, type like create a uh, multiply uh, case please for us yeah it's just the finished test and all right, that's all. We save the file and here we have the completed program. So this is the way how GitLab helps you uh, to reduce your time spent and focus more uh, on, the, on the productivity uh, of your code and on the creativity of your vision of the code. So uh, I will show you just the one more example in Python maybe. Uh, we I'm gonna open the file yeah mm -hmm. it suggested us and the file which we are uh, in right now and for example uh, we want to count uh, the lines so i will just type count the lines in the file yeah uh 
and it suggested us uh, a few methods uh, to count the file. For example, if we do not prefer this one, let's just change this read lines. Uh, yep, like this as f, f read, and uh, we could not only uh, choose the one right way, we could also use like lines, uh, f read lines, and uh, it suggests us to count like zero, and uh, we could count it with just the simple cycle line in lines yeah and it will print the count but uh, it doesn't seem like an optimal method so um, python 3 um, test.py <clears throat> unexpected intent uh, yeah just a second so As F, yeah, doesn't mean. Uh, all right. Uh, we, if if we open the file, uh, yeah, we could read the line. And I want to tell you that we not only could choose the one right way. So if we want to read the file with the four cycle, or we want to count the lines uh, with the LAN method, we could tell uh, the GitLab AI features, uh, please. Uh, do something like count the lines of code, yeah, and print the lines. And also, we could choose like count uh, the lines with the len, yeah, and it would count and split the lines with the len method. So, this is the way how GitLab provides you the support in your coding you not uh you're not in the jail of your uh of your mind you could choose many ways uh, to develop your product and it helps your developers to deliver more uh, creative and efficient code so uh let's get back into our presentation just a second, guys. Yeah, here it is. And when we finished our coding, uh, we gonna commit all our changes and get into the merge request. And we want somebody to review the quality of our code. So GitLab's, GitLab here provides you the possibility to um, find the best people uh, to review your code they are who more familiar with your code uh, with your stack and uh, based on the ai models gitlab provides you the uh, suggestions in uh, choosing the guy who will review your uh, changes in the product so this is also one of the coolest feature for the big companies where many people in the team uh, and many guys who could help you in reviewing your code and advise you something, GitLab helps you in suggestions, the guys, the, the right guy who will help you to merge your request. All right. And the feature Peter told us about uh, its explanation, the code. So in any file, in uh, any supported language uh, source, you could just highlight the line and GitLab will explain you the code on your, uh, in English, uh, but it, it will be the natural language, yeah? So it will tell you what is this method for, uh, where it comes from, uh, in which class, and what this program do for, uh, for the whole source. So this is a really crazy feature, for my opinion. It helps you um, to speed quickly on the code uh, you have been given to secure and operate. 
uh, it's amazing feature and i guess mm, this is one of the mm, coolest one in gitlab ai platform in the whole platform and also uh a help with git commands so mm, if you are not familiar with Git or you don't want to waste so many time or you want to explore the new Git uh, command, so you could ask GitLab like mm, uh, how to uh, get back in my commit uh, and I want to uh, get a, create a new commit and go to merge. So GitLab, please uh, explain the commands and give it to me. I want to. Mm, yeah, I, I want to get the new knowledges and I want to explore the new commands. Uh, GitLab helps you in this and you could write the request in the natural language. So you don't need to uh, like type the technical parts. Uh, so you only need to ask GitLab uh, and GitLab could, will help you based on the AI. So uh, what about the next slide? This is the vulnerability which Peter uh, explained to you guys, and this is one of the coolest feature. I also think this is very cool in security way. Peter, please, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Ilya, can you set it up in a way that I can move the slides because I don't have the, the sure, control, sure, right? Peter, now. just a second, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, about the explain this vulnerability feature in the meanwhile. So it's it it very much very similar to what Ilya was talking about. Uh, explain to me this code, but it's more about you already wrote the code, maybe with the help of code suggestion, as Ilya already showed in his very good demo, and you got a security vulnerability notification from GitLab, right? Because GitLab. That's why we call it the DevSecOps platform. So not just DevOps, but developer security operations, right? So, and the sec part is really that GitLab has built-in security features, which help you and your team to get notified of security vulnerabilities before you go into production. So before something bad happens to your database and through your database to your users, GitLab can help you with not notifying you about those warnings. And that's fine. That works really nice most of the time. And most of the time, GitLab is even able to give you solutions like, OK, this vulnerability is because your dependencies are outdated. Please update them. That's the easy case. But there are much more sophisticated attack surfaces that can be in a source code. So for example, as you can see on this slide, how an XML vulnerability can affect, I mean, parsing vulnerability can affect the security of your source code or you could think about sql injections i i guess most of you are familiar with those kind of problems in these cases giving an automated suggestion on what to do to fix those problems is very difficult and that's where our ai features comes into play so our ai features analyze the code that your vulnerability have been detected upon get a context and then give you suggestions about, okay, this is exactly what you need to do. So like this function is the one that is vulnerable or this expression, this, this concatenation that you are doing with strings is vulnerable and you can replace it this and that way. So again, it won't do the fix for you, not, by, not, not even close to that, but it can, as exactly as Ilya, I think very, very well put and very nicely described with the explain to me this code, feature that it can shorten the time that you spend with understanding the problem right so as same with the code uh, explain to me this code you still need to understand the code right so ai won't replace that you as a developer you still need to read it you need to understand it to be able to modify it but it can shorten the time that is needed to actually get to the point where you can contribute back to the project that you are working on and it's the same with the explain this vulnerability you still need to understand deeply the problem and you still need to verify what the AI is giving you the right solution. But I, I believe if you are a developer, you, you know that at least that was for me before joining GitLab, I was a software engineer. And most of my time I spent with Googling actually, less, less with writing code. It was more like, okay, why is it not working? How do I make it work? And that's the part of the work that these features can, can 
can really, really shorten down because you don't need to search for, okay, what do I need? It will give you suggestions and then you can dig deeper and dig down into the actual features. So I think it's very important and it connects to a topic that comes up a lot of times and we talk about GitLab's AI features to customers and prospects that many business decision makers think that these features will replace developers or replace project members and i can say with great confidence it's not like that i mean these features are really for increasing your productivity making you available to do more work in shorter time but it won't replace a person not in their current state i don't know what the feature brings but i can say with great certainty that it's better to think about these AI features more like a new search engine or a new interface to get information from, but you still need the human to understand that information and put that into action. I think that's very important to call out. And these two features that we, we, we explained, these two features are the greatest example of that. So they seem like, wow, really cool. And they are really cool, but they won't replace the human in the in the process at all they just make our work much more i would say enjoyable less tedious searching so next feature generate tests in merge requests very very similar to the code suggestions but it works in the context of a merge request so when you already have some code that you want to put into your production then gitlab can go ahead and suggest you test cases that you missed so it's what Ilya did in the code suggestion demo, he already used code suggestion to generate the tests, right? So there's a certain overlap in between these two features. It's more about when somebody forgets to add tests, right? So you see the code, everything is nice, it's ready to go into production, but you also see that, okay, our test coverage has decreased. Then you can recommend to the person who opened that merge request, or you can catch yourself if you created that merge request, okay, some test needs to be added. And GitLab can go ahead, again, understand the context and suggest you merge uh, tests in a merge request that you can say, okay, this is nice. This is what I exactly wanted to write just with the code suggestions. And with one click, you can just add them to the merge request. The pipelines will run, your tests will run. And again, you just save so much time because instead of going to your IDE, writing the code yourself, testing it, testing the tests, you know, you just have it there. So again, just reducing the time, but you still need the knowledge yourself what you want to do. Issue summaries, this is another feature which for me personally, to be honest, is extremely useful because I work at GitLab and at GitLab, so at GitLab, the company, we use GitLab, the product to develop GitLab. So GitLab is for everything essentially. And we have an open backlog. So our backlog is open to everybody to see. And there are issues there like bug reports or feature requests that uh, sometimes can even stay open for four years. I'm not joking, four or five years easily. And you can imagine under four years, during four years, how many comments can accumulate on those issues. So if you're a new developer, let's say you join GitLab as a software engineer and your, your team lead says, hey, Peter, could you just look at this issue? It's been open for a while. And then you open it and you will see that it has 1000 comments and you're like, okay, I, I, I will spend one week just reading these comments and most likely you will. <laughs> but the, the point of issue summary is that it can summarize you the comments. Obviously, again, you will still need to read some of the comments, maybe most of the comments, but it will give you a feel for an overview of, okay, what's going on here? What needs to be done? Again, just get into the, the the context much quicker than you would need to read them one by one and it works really nice i can say um, yeah i'm a gitlab employee so i must say nice things about gitlab right but i can say this this not as a gitlab employee as well that it works really really nice and it makes my life so much easier i can't even tell you summarize merge request changes very similar to the previous one but it's more geared towards obviously merge requests so when you already have a merge request that's open for a long time, or maybe not open for a long time, but I can imagine that you've been in situations where there's a very heated conversation, maybe an argument about something in the context of a merge request, again, just helps you to get an understanding of what's going on 
before you join the argument yourself, right? No, not argument, but like the before you join the conversation yourself, you can get a, get an overview of what's going on again much quicker than you yourself reading all the issue uh, issue merge request comments yourself. Summarize my merge request review. This is another spin on the same thing, so to say. So it's about you are a reviewer. You write a lot of comments. So let's say it's a very big merge request, right? Somebody is working on it for weeks. And there are many changes and you do a lot of comments or somebody does a lot of comments. So like, I don't know, you have more than 20 comments on a single change in a merge request. So what this can do to you, it can give you again a context. So not much to say compared to the other uh, features. It's just a different, different place where we put this feature into the whole line of DevSecOps. And that's basically what I wanted to wanted to show you at the beginning. So this is how we very similar features, sometimes very overlapping features, but it's at different points of the product where you can interact with the AI capabilities of GitLab and get the productivity boost from that. So this is more or less about that as well. And GitLab chat, this is really nice if you are new to GitLab. So I just joined GitLab one year ago. I would have give half of my arm just to have this feature. I'm not joking. So this feature is about in the context of GitLab, you can open a chat window. If you use ChatGPT or some similar chat solutions, it's basically the same experience. And in just hum actual human language, so in this case, English is the best, but you can try with other languages, actually. I tried with Hungarian, and it was like, hmm, more or less OK answer, but obviously the best is English. And it can give you answers about overall questions about GitLab, like like you see in the screenshot, how do I set up a pipeline file? Or you can ask, how do I assign an issue to a person? And what it does, again, under the hood, it's not a, not a great complex feature. What it does, it will take your question and search our documentation, so docs.gitlab.com. It will search that public documentation. So it's not doing anything that you couldn't do as a human being. It's just, again, shortening the time you need because you don't need to go to the website, look for it navigate through a lot of pages it just gives you a pointer and it's very important that it gives you the actual pointer where it found the source right so you can see on the picture it gives you an answer but it also gives you okay this is where i found this information in the documentation and then you as a developer or a project member just click on that link go to the documentation and if you need more information or more context you can drive deeper into that piece of documentation so again just the overall overall messaging here. Value stream forecasting, that's something that in itself a rather new feature. For those of you who don't know it or not familiar with it, it's more geared towards, I wouldn't say a certain persona because I think everybody for, for everybody it's very useful to see what's going on. It's coming back to the, the fact that GitLab is a single application. We have a single database where all the data regarding your DevSecOps pipeline or life cycle is being stored. And value streams are basically about that. So it gets data out of your processes and it can show you, okay, how frequently you deploy to production, how much time you spend with bug fixing. That for me as a software engineer is amazing. So you can just go to this feature and see how much time out of your working time you spend with bug fixing. That can be a great indicator for something bad or something good. So if you spend two thirds of your time with bug fixing, something might not be right with your product, right? So you might change your processes. And that's all what value stream forecasting is about. It not just gives you historical data, but with the use of AI, it can give you predictions. So like it can identify trends in your processes and you can give in give you a glimpse into the future so to say obviously it won't it's not future telling it's just a computer but it can give you an indication what direction you are moving towards so is my bug fixing time increasing with what i'm doing right now or i am actually decreasing the time spent with bug fixing because of the changes i'm making to my processes so this feature is all about that it's more a reporting feature, as I said, less for software engineers, but even for me as a software engineer, it, it's sometimes really, really useful, really valuable data. And that's it for the AI enabled features. As I said, we have two groups of features. The one is that applicable for more or less everybody. And in the last 
couple of slides of this presentation, I would like to just uh, quickly hit on our model ops features, we call them this way. And these are the features which I mentioned at the beginning. These are the features that about you as a software engineer or software engineering organization want to develop your own AI models. So your own, let's say, you want to develop a competitor to ChatGPT. These are the features that you would use for that, right? So the other features are useful regardless of your workload, if it's a mobile app, web app, doesn't matter. These features, which I will talk about now, these are specifically geared towards people and teams and organizations who are developing their own AI. And this is important because more and more of our customers we see are getting into the, into the play, getting into the ring in this area. So we wanted to make sure that they can keep using GitLab and they don't need to spread their tool set. They can keep the single platform approach while still being able to do their best work to bring value to their customers. But what is model ops? Everything is an ops right now. So we have DevOps, DevSecOps, model ops, everything is an ops. So, so what is that actually? And I can introduce you even more ops here on this slide. So we have data ops and ML ops. And without getting into the details, the, the, the point here is that GitLab is a DevSecOps platform, right? So we develop secure and operate your applications. That's what you do with GitLab. We are slowly but steadily spreading into two different areas, ML ops and data ops. And these three ops together make model ops, <laughs> essentially. Data ops is about working with big data. So if you have thousands of terabytes of data and you want to get insights out of that, that's what data ops is. We don't do that yet. So we don't have anything on the roadmap for that. We are not investing right now into that. That's a different topic from now uh, for us right now. MLOps is the one that we are investing a lot these days, and that's the one where you can work with machine learning or AI models inside GitLab other than using a third party tool. And those are the features which I will show you right now. So, one of those features, and this is the central, I think this is the most important feature that we have right now. It's available, but it's experiment experimental so it's not generally available but you can already give it a try and actually we are using it internally at gitlab as well so what it is it's basically a place in gitlab where you can store the results of your experiment so just on a very high level how a machine learning so how a, an ai engineer works they run code on their local machine running these AI models, feeding data into them, and then evaluating the output of those data. So you can think about it in case of a chatbot, asking questions and seeing the question, the answers make sense. Okay, that's, that's a very basic example, but you get the point. Obviously, there are much more sophisticated usage of, of AI and especially in data processing. So you can, you can look for, I don't know, weather data. You can look at weather data and try to uh try to forecast when a storm will come and, or where it will hit or if there will be a flood what which part of a country will be affected by a flood that's a great ai or machine learning use case and to to sharpen that model to make it more accurate you can use these experiments and in this case gitlab can store the result of these experiments which will show up in a central place so everybody in your team will be able to see the results. It's very similar to CI CD. You can think about this if you're a software engineer, you can think about it like kind of like CI CD pipelines, I mean the value, but in context of machine learning. At least that's how I think about it. I'm not an AI professional. So if you are and this was stupid, please don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> so yeah, this this is the goal here with this feature. Self-hosted GPU runners, also a very useful thing because, I mean, if you are into software and if you are into uh, software engineering, you might be aware of the GPUs are just getting more and more expensive, like nonstop. So if you are playing video games, you, I'm sure that you are aware of the fact that now buying a video card for your computer is kind of like buying a new car, essentially. And that's not different for software engineering projects. So what we do at GitLab, we, we we, through our 
uh, through our uh, connection with Google Cloud, actually, we've been able to secure some GPU run runner resources for our customers. So it just makes it much easier to work with your AI workloads and run your AI models in, in the context of your GitLab pipeline, because we are able to give you essentially cheaper prices for GPU runners through our connection with Google. And this is this is the feature that is really exciting to me because we hear that feedback a lot from customers that, yes, it's difficult to get reasonably priced GPUs and virtual machines with that kind of GPU. So we are trying to help help these kind of customers as well. And so this was the self posted. Sorry, I'm messing up the slides. I, I, I changed it up. So what I was talking about is actually the SaaS GPU runner. So this is what we provide as part of our GitLab.com infrastructure. And now you can also manage your own GPU runners in your own infrastructure. So in this case, we are not helping with getting those GPU VMs, right? But we help you to manage them separately from the rest of your pipeline runners. So you can configure your pipelines and make it just more easy for your team to say, OK, this is a regular VM. I can run any workload on it. Or if it's a GPU VM with edit capabilities that will help me to run my AI workloads. So that's that's what we do on that space. And the model registry, that's not out. It's not, you cannot try it. This is the only feature in this whole presentation that is not available for trying. This is just on the roadmap, but we are working on this. If you are aware of our package registry or container registry features, this is exactly the same just for machine learning models or AI models. So when you you use our experiment tracking feature to sharpen your AI models, when you are happy with them, the results are good. You can publish the resulting models into GitLab, and then your developer teams can just consume the models from there so they can include it in their application from a central repository, much like our, our package registry or container registry, just for machine learning workloads. And pretty much that was it. So we covered a lot with Ilya, and we discussed many, many different topics. So we would like to open up the rest of the, of the webinar, the remaining 10 minutes or so, to questions and answers. So we are curious about what you are curious about, and we will do our best to answer your questions. So please feel free to. I'm also checking the chat if we already have some questions, and we do. So let me just take a look at them and and uh, and uh, answer the ones that are already there. Yes, I will Michael. I could answer some uh, if you're okay, okay here. Yeah, but uh, I was uh, reading the questions, and most of them are about the license in this feature. And uh, I guess we didn't mention enough about this, but. Um, Code suggestions are available in the premium version and uh, all of the other features, yeah, as I understand, most of them are available in the ultimate uh, versions of GitLab SaaS. So uh, this is the way how GitLab uh, see um, the way of developing their features and included, including them, them in the licenses and their plans they provide for the customers. So uh, I also yes, see and, that... uh, just just adding to that a bit. So so right now, since most of our features are in experimental stage, right, they are available to all customers on GitLab.com, regardless of premium or ultimate. So everybody, if you go to GitLab.com, you can create a trial account. You can try them. When they will be generally available, so production ready, all of them. We will introduce some changes, and this is something that we are still working out the details of. So how will they be part of Ultimate? Will they be part of Premium? Will they be part of both? We are not sure yet, so I'm not, I'm not able to share with you what will be the final structure. What is 100% sure that they will won't be available on the free tier, that's for sure. So either a Premium or Ultimate will be needed. And right now, all these features are only available on GitLab.com. I think I already uh, wrote about that in the chat, but we are working really hard. So code suggestions you can use on self-managed instances as well. That's the only feature that you can use on self-managed. 
but we are working really hard on bringing all of these features to self managed customers as well. So I just want to highlight this because this comes up a lot of times, causes a great deal of confusion. So the reason why these features are available on gitlab.com is not because we try to force customers to go gitlab.com. It's just that on a technical level, this was the easiest to implement. We want it to be fast to market. We wanted to bring these features quickly to our customers. The easiest way was to put them only on gitlab.com. But right now, I'm actually pasting that into the chat. So we have an open issue on gitlab.com. I just pasted it into the chat, the link to that. If you are curious, you can follow along how we develop these features to be available on self-managed uh, installations, right? So this is the same backlog. This is the same uh, epic that our engineering team is using. So everything is in the public. If you are curious when a certain feature will come to self-managed or what's the future of a certain feature, please just refer to this epic. And, and it's very transparent. I use the same epic to follow along. So even as a GitLab employee, I use the same source of information. Just, I just wanted to highlight this. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, for me personally, and I guess for the rest of the people here, that's crazy that GitLab provides all of the features. Um, it's in beta; it doesn't matter. But all of these AI features for the customers to test, like not like the other companies do. Uh, we develop something, and you could only buy our the most expensive tariff plan yeah. to test them. Yeah, so that's really cool because um, I shared it with many of my friends. Like they have just uh, they just have the GitLab free account, and they could test all of this coolest features many people works on it so uh, I also see the questions about the versions yeah uh, is there a GitLab version uh, called dedicate or is it possible to use the functionality you were discussing spe spe specifically uh, in that version so uh, the GitLab AI features were provided in 16.0 update yeah as I remember and from the 16 version till the newest one you are available to use uh, the GitLab features. But we also, uh, I guess Peter, Peter will agree with me, uh, we recommend you to use the latest uh, stable version of GitLab. Uh, of course. And we could guarantee uh, this feature works properly in the, in the latest versions, uh, not in yes. the old one. But uh, reverse com compatibility also um, supported. So uh, maybe course. you will... Uh, answer the uh, last question yeah about the gitlab workflow extension yeah i'm i'm checking there's also a question about data data handling from lucas let me uh, get that out of the way so lucas i'm pasting a link into the chat here you can see exactly how we are processing customer data for code suggestions so this documentation is about code suggestions here you can see what code suggestions is doing literally under the hood. So what AI model we are using, what data we are processing. And it's very important that we don't train on customer data. So the models that we are using are provided by Google and Google trains their model on publicly available, permissively licensed code. So if you use our code suggestion feature, the suggestions you get, you can be 100% sure that nobody else is getting the same suggestions. I mean. Nobody else is getting your source code as part of the suge suggestions because your source code is yours. It never gets incorporated into the model. And you cannot get into legal trouble for using our suggestions because the code that is being generated in based on licensed code handpicked by Google. So Google guarantees that this code is not, not in violation of any license requirements. So you can rest assured that the suggestions you get, you can keep using and you won't get into legal trouble because you get generated code based on some license that wouldn't allow it. That can happen with other solutions. We are very, very, very uh, careful about that. And we make sure that it's not like that for us. And for the rest of the AI features, features I'm pasting also into the chat. Here you can see the rest of our features, how they process data, what data they process, how they handle your data when you use them. So you can you can learn more about this in these two links. 
And uh, I also, yeah. oh, sorry. I also see uh, the question very interesting for me personally. Uh, this is the um, uh, Michael's question. Yeah, uh, if you install the GitLab workflow, so when you are configuring the code suggestions for your VS Code. Uh, in GitLab documentation, we have the promotion video uh, where the GitLab guy uh, or a girl uh, setting up all of these features. And uh, I guess GitLab changed something in configuration, but uh, in the video, uh, they uh, used the read API and read user flags when you're creating an access token. So, uh, but for real, you should use just API and uh, read user flags. Uh, this is the two flags you need to use to mm, make your suggestions available in uh, GitLab workflow uh, plugin for your VS Code. And also make sure you turn it on uh, for your personal account if you use personal account uh, for suggestions in the GitLab.com. So, uh, and if you use it for a group, make sure you uh, turned it on for the uh, head group uh, in your gitlab.com project or uh, organization, uh, whatever. So uh, this is the tricky question, and I hope. Oh, and then I yes, uh, exactly, Ilya. I think this is very important. I'm, I'm answering to Michal that. Yes, you need to connect your VS Code instance to GitLab.com, but you also, as you said, you need to enable these features on the instance and the group level as well. And it all connects to our privacy first approach and enterprise grade approach, right? So we want to make sure that if you are a GitLab admin, you can you can set the required features on the whole organization level, right? So an individual developer cannot decide that they want to use a certain feature. It must be approved on the instance level and then allowed for a given project to be able to use it. And, and you will find more information about it in the documentation. And as Ilya said, that's very important that these settings are changing release by release because these are more or less, most of them experimental features. So if you see a video and you don't find those settings, yeah, just go to the documentation that's always up to date because we release the documentation at the same time as we release a new version of our product. And yeah, the checkboxes might be completely different place and so on. So that's important. Yeah, because it's up to date in the documentation text, yes. but uh, maybe it couldn't uh, be not up to date in the promotion video or some some materials on YouTube yeah, yeah, where exactly. guys are viewing these features. Yeah. So I also see the questions from Jess uh about the configuration so uh not all of the features by default already pre-configured or something uh, you should uh, get into documentation and it depends on the feature you need to configure something make some changes uh locally on your machine uh or in the gitlab uh, instance you have so exactly exactly and uh, yeah i think we are we are more or less on time so we would like to thank you everybody for attending this webinar.